Greetings again today in the name of Jesus Christ, our wonderful Lord and Savior. Now we're glad to see you here in the house of the Lord on the first Sunday in this new year. It's a good way to start the year off by being in God's house on this day. Maybe some of you are sick and providentially hindered that couldn't be here. You're out in the radio listening audience, but we appreciate the ones who are here. And to you that's listening out in the radio listening audience, we appreciate you tuning in to Northside Baptist Church Hour that's coming to you live right from the auditorium of the Northside Baptist Church here in Athens, Georgia. Now this is Preacher Edward speaking. We're hoping during the next hour we can be an inspiration to you. And you in the radio listen audience, if you have a phone there nearby, if you get on that phone and call us shut in, have them to tune in and get the Northside Baptist Church hour. We try to be a blessing to them as well. You'll be doing them a favor, be doing us a favor. So if you'll do that, we appreciate it. Now at this time, Paul will take over and direct the song service. I'm sure what he has lined up for our hearts will be a blessing to us. So Paul at this time. Get your hymnal, turn to page 305. Good to see every one of you, so I want you to turn, will you please, in your Bibles to two places. I want you to turn, first of all, to the book of Isaiah, chapter 5. And then I want you to turn to Luke in the New Testament, chapter 13. Isaiah, chapter 5, and Luke, chapter 13. 
Time is moving on. We're now in a new year. I closed out the old year on Friday afternoon with a funeral. I entered into the new year yesterday afternoon with a funeral. So people are dying. Time is moving on. The Lord is soon coming. And we never know what's going to happen during this year. That's why it behooves us to be ready. The Bible says, be ye also ready. For such an hour as you think not, the Son of Man cometh. No doubt many of you have seen much trouble during the past year. If so, I hope things will be better this year. We all have our problems, our troubles, disappointments, and heartaches. Some of you heard me give this before about two little boys playing on a train. The conductor said the children must behave or there'll be trouble. The boy's father said, you don't know what trouble is. My wife's in the hospital. I'm on my way to see my sick mother-in-law. My daughter's just given birth to triplets. One of the boys here just mashed his finger and the other just chewed up our train tickets. And to top it all off, I just discovered we're on the wrong train. So sometimes you can have trouble. I uh, hear in California a few years ago, there's a man out on the Golden Gate Bridge about ready to jump off, commit suicide. They tried to talk him out of it to no avail. They said the only hope we have is to get the preacher to go and talk with him. So they rounded up the preacher, sent him out on the bridge, and he stood out there and talked to the man about 30 minutes, and both of them jumped off and drowned. So we all have problems that confront us as we sojourn, but by God's grace and help, we can overcome and endure. Now, for you listening in the radio listening audience here at the auditorium, I want you to know these tapes are available. If you'd like to have the tape for today's program or any tape that we've taped in the past, you're welcome to write in and enclose a gift of $5 or more to help pay for radio time. Request whatever tape you want, we'll get it in the mail to you. I do want you to pray for us this year. I'm now in my 35th year of daily broadcasting from the classic city of Athens. It's not a bit easy. Had not God raised up prayer warriors and financial supporters, we could never made it. And so we work this together in getting out the gospel. Those that pray for me and back me up and those that contribute to this ministry financially, we're all working together to get the gospel out. And your efforts and your sacrifices, your support is not in vain. I do hope many of you will pray for us doing this year. And if God should impress upon you to stand by us financially, we appreciate it. He'll bless you for it. The devil fights us in every way possible. He hates this ministry. He hates this broadcast. He hates our efforts. He's going to do everything he can to discourage and stop and hinder but God's always come out victorious, and I feel like you'll continue to do so. And you pray for us, you and the radio listen audience, write to me. My mailing address is Virgil Edwards, P.O. Box 501, Athens, Georgia, zip code is 30603. So you write to me today, and I appreciate it. Now in the book of Isaiah, I want to read a few verses there, and then I go to the book of Luke for a few verses. Now in my Bible, Isaiah chapter 5 is found on page 716. If you don't have the same kind of Bible, the Schofield Reference Bible, I'm not sure what it would be on your Bible, the page number. But in Isaiah chapter 5, beginning with verse 1, Now will I sing to my well-beloved a song of my beloved touching his vineyard. My well-beloved hath a vineyard in a very fruitful hill. He fenced it and gathered out the stones thereof, and planted it with the choice vine, and built a tower in the midst of it, and also made a wine press therein. And he looked that it should bring forth grapes, and it brought forth wild grapes. And now, O inhabitants of Jerusalem and men of Judah, judge, I pray you, betwixt me and my vineyard. What could have been done more to my vineyard than I have not done in it? Wherefore, when I looked that it should bring forth grapes, it brought forth wild grapes. 
And now go to, I will tell you what I will do to my vineyard. I will take away the heads thereof, and it shall be eaten up, and break down the wall thereof, and it shall be trodden down. I will lay it waste, it shall not be pruned, nor digged, but there shall come up briars and thorns. I will also command the clouds that there rain no rain upon it. For the vineyard of the Lord of hosts is the house of Israel, and the men of Judah his pleasant plant. And he looked for judgment, but behold, oppression. For righteousness, but behold, a cry. That's reading from Isaiah chapter 5, the first seven verses. Now I want you to turn to the book of Luke, chapter 13. I want you to keep your Bible open at Luke chapter 13. I will read four verses. I will expatiate upon these verses. I believe from these verses we can find something that will help us. Luke chapter 13, page 1094, beginning with verse 6. He spake also this parable. A certain man had a fig tree planted in his vineyard. And he came and sought fruit thereon and found none. Then said he unto the dresser of his vineyard, Behold, these three years I come seeking fruit on this fig tree and find none. Cut it down, why cometh it to ground? And he answered and said unto him, Lord, let it alone this year also, till I shall dig about it and dung it. And if it bear fruit well, and if not then, after that thou shalt cut it down. I want you to notice the phrase, will you please, in verse 8, where it says, this year also. This year also. I think that's a good thought at the beginning of this new year to think about this year also. I will take these verses and we'll take a look at them and apply them to our very hearts as the one that God's expecting to produce the fruit this year. Now I know this is primarily to Israel. God took them out of a barren country and planted them in fertile Canaan. Christ sought for fruit from them for three years and found none. Israel was then cut off and scattered according to Romans chapter 11 and verse 20. Now I read in the Old Testament where God was disappointed in that he found no fruit in his vineyard. He looked for it, he found none. He tore down that vineyard, he tore down the walls, he stopped the rain, and there was no vineyard left to produce fruit. Then when we come to the New Testament, we find here a person disappointed because there was no fruit in the vineyard. Now, if you ever travel the Middle East, you know there's many vineyards over there. And for hundreds and hundreds of years, they have depended upon those vineyards, many of them, for their livelihood. They grow beautiful grapes. Now, God has a vineyard. God has a people. We are God's vine. We are God's people. We are the producers. And God has planted us in his vineyard as those Israelites did in days gone by and as they do today as they depended upon their vineyard for grapes for fruit God is depending solely upon his church upon his people to produce the goods now you can't find where God expects the unsaved the sinner or any other club or organization to produce the goods God wants his church to do so the truly born again believers that's God's divine plan. And so let's take a good close look at these four verses found here in Luke chapter 13, verses 6 to 9. And keep in mind the phrase, this year also. This year also. We don't know what the year holds. Now Paul said, forgetting those things which are behind and looking forward to those things in the future. I understand there's an Indian tribe down in South America. They have it right the other way around. They say the past is the future, and the future is the past. Now the way they interpret that is they say what we did in the past is going to help us out here in the future. We know what we've done, we know what we should have done and didn't do. Therefore the past is our future, they say. 
And then they say the future, we don't know what's out there. We haven't seen that. We haven't experienced anything out there. We'll put that in the past. And the tribe believes that. And they practice to that extent. And so, but we see it differently. Paul said, forgetting those things which are behind, we look forward to the prize of the high calling in Christ Jesus of things in the future. Now we notice several things about this vineyard. The Bible tells us in verse 6 that this tree was chosen and planted in a vineyard. Now somebody chose a tree, a fig tree, and planted that fig tree in a vineyard. Now many of you have fruit trees. Some of you farmers listen to me out there in the radio listen audience. You have your, your farms, you have your orchards, you planted your vineyards, you planted those trees for a purpose. Now this Bible tells us this tree was chosen. Look at verse 6. He spake also this parable. A certain man had a fig tree planted in his vineyard. And he came and sought fruit thereon, but he found none. Can you imagine this man planting that tree? And then in due time, when he should have gathered some figs, he went out there and didn't find the first one. Now I want you to notice it was a chosen tree. This man selected this tree. He chose this tree himself. He chose it for a purpose. And then the Bible tells us he planted this tree. Not only did he choose the tree, he planted the tree. And he supplied the fertilizer of the soil for the tree. And then he protected that tree. No doubt he had a hedge around it. He protected that. And that was the tree the man had chosen. Now God planted us in Psalms chapter 1 and verse 13. And ye should be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that bringeth forth his fruit in his season. Now God said we'd be like a tree planted by a river of water. Now that tree planted by that water can draw moisture from the water and produce the goods. The Holy Spirit is symbolic. The water is symbolic of the Holy Spirit and the Word of God. And God has planted us where He wants us and He gives us the Spirit of God to guide us and help us to get the job done. God's planted you. God's planted you, the members of this church. God planted you here at Northside. God planted me here. We have been planted here by the Lord to do a work in God's vineyard. This is God's vineyard. And so we're planted. The tree was chosen, planted in the vineyard. The second thing about this scripture here in Luke is, it was owned by a certain man. Now this tree wasn't just out here in the field, happening up and owned by no one. It was owned by a certain man. I want to say to you today, you are not your own. You're owned by a certain man, and that man is God Almighty, Jesus Christ. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 19 and 20, What know you not that your body is a temple of the Holy Ghost which is in you, which you have of God? You are not your own. For you are bought with a price, therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. Had you heard people say, well... I'm on my own boss. I'm over 21. I'll do what I please. Uh, nobody tells me what to do. I, I'll do what I want to do. Now, if you're God's child, if you're saved, I need to set you straight. You're not your own anymore. Amen. You don't belong to yourself anymore. You belong to God. And you're to please God at all costs. You can't do what you want to do at all times. The Bible says no man liveth to himself and no man dies to himself. You belong to God Almighty. He bought you with his own precious blood and you're the Lord's. You belong to him. You've been purchased by his precious blood. And Simon Peter tells us that blood is more precious than silver and gold. You belong to the Lord. You need to realize that. Then, uh, then we need to realize that, that we bought by the blood of Jesus Christ and we need to realize that the blood of Jesus Christ is more precious than any silver or gold. 
More precious than any silver or gold, the Bible tells us. Now, excuse me, we're having a little trouble, and I found the trouble right here. And I think we have it settled. Okay, well, we, we find that the blood of Jesus Christ is more precious than silver and gold, and we need to realize that. The blood of Jesus Christ, the Bible tells us, is far, far more precious than any silver or any gold. And then we are, of course, owned by this certain man. What know you not? Your body is a temple of the Holy Ghost, which, you, which is in you, which you have of God, and you're not joined for you're bought with a price. Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. And so we belong to the Lord. Then number three, it was planted to bring forth fruit. The Bible said that tree was planted in that vineyard to bring forth fruit. Now, God didn't save us just to be wall pictures or uh, just for someone to look at. Or God saved us to serve, to produce the goods, to bring forth fruit. A man goes out, he plants his farm, and, and there he uh, sets out his trees. He does that not just necessarily to look at. If he's a farmer, depending on that for his livelihood, he's wanting some fruit. And it's the same way with God in verse 6. A certain man had a fig tree planted in his vineyard. He came and sought fruit thereon. And the Bible says in John chapter 15 and verse 8, Here is my Father glorified that you bear much fruit, so shall you be my disciples. Now this certain man that owned the fig tree expected fruit from that tree. It was planted for that purpose. This man would not have gone out and bought a fig tree and planted that tree, digging up the soil, fertilizing that tree, building protection around that tree, had not this man expected some figs from that tree. Now when God Almighty saved you at the expense of the blood of his son, God saved you not just to look at or for someone else to look at. God saved you that you might produce the goods. God wants you to be fruitful. God wants you to bring forth fruit unto Him. Now we know a peach tree, the fruit of a peach tree is another peach. Now we do know then the fruit of a Christian is winning somebody to God. Now the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, meekness, goodness, temperance, and so forth. That's the fruit of the Spirit. And that is to be manifest in our lives as we yield to the Spirit of God, but as we reach others, then we produce the fruit. You plant a peach tree, it grows up, and you say, well, I want fruit. Now, what do you get? You get another peach. Now, God has saved us, bought us, planted us, that we might produce other Christians. Now, sheep produce sheep. Shepherds don't produce sheep. It's up to the church members to win souls, to get people to God, to get them on the influence of the gospel. Now, to be sure, the pastor should win all that he can, but he's the under-shepherd. The shepherd do not produce sheep. The sheep produce sheep. And God expects every true born-again believer to produce others, that is, to win others to Christ. You read about the early church in the days of the early church, and you find the Bible said they went everywhere preaching and winning souls to God except the apostles that remained in Jerusalem. The sheep went out and produced sheep. Now, to be sure, God expects the preacher to be a soul winner. But you need to realize God expects you to produce souls, and every sheep should be a producer of other sheep. A winner of other people of God. A soul winner. And if all the members of the church were winning others to God. Were soul winners they should be. Your church would be running over. And the pastor would be baptizing people every Sunday. If the members were producing fruit as they should. Now God expects you to do that. God bought you. He planted you. He protects you. He cares for you. And God is looking for the fruit. We come to thought number four, and that is the owner came to check the tree for the fruit. Verse six. 
He came and sought fruit thereupon. Now God has a perfect right. A perfect right to expect fruit from us. And he has a perfect right to check on us. To see whether or not we are producing the goods. He came and sought fruit thereupon. God has a right to check your life. I've known a lot of people, even church members, some I think saved. They probably have a sickness and something happens and then they begin to think about God and as soon as they start getting better, they forget God. But God don't forget what He did for you. You should never do that. The best way to have God near to you when you're sick is to serve God while you're well. A lot of people only try to serve God and use God when they're sick or in great need. God wants you to serve him seven days a week. And then in, when you're in need or when you're sick, God is able to be there to help you. Now, God has a right to check our lives. And God will check our lives this year also. He has a right to expect fruit from us. We are fruit producers, the Bible tells us. And God is disappointed when he checks our lives and finds no fruit. Now let me get a little more personal today with you here in the auditorium especially. If God checked your life for fruit produced in 1982 and checked my life and all of our lives, and he does, I guess if we'd realize, as we should, what it means to God, we'd hang our heads in shame. How much fruit did we produce in 1982? God has a perfect right to check our lives and check our church to see how much fruit we're bearing. And so he came to uh, check the tree for the fruit. And of course he's disappointed when he finds it not. Then we come to thought number five and that is the master's complaint. That is he complains about it. The man that owned the vineyard and planted the tree complains he has a right to do so. Look at verse 7. Then said he unto the dresser of his vineyard, Behold, these three years I come seeking fruit on this fig tree, and findeth none. Cut it down while it cometh hit the ground. For three years this man came and looked for his figs, and there were no figs on the tree. For three years, Jesus came and looked to Israel for fruit, but he found none. Now, he was long-suffering. For three long years, Jesus walked up and down the shores of Galilee, and there he looked for fruit from Israel, but found no fruit. Now, God is long-suffering. As God looks back over our lives as an individual, or as a church in the past, say, three years, how much yet will he find fruit being produced or having been produced? God is long-suffering. But sometimes his patience, he, he has a, a wearied patience. This man did here. God's long-suffering, but God's patience will eventually wear out with us if we don't produce the fruit. And so he complains. The man complains about it. The owner of the fig tree complained. He said, three years, three long years I've come here and found no figs on this tree. Then what did he say? He said to his servant, cut it down. Cut this tree down. Cut it down, he said. Why let it come at the ground? Cut it down. He complained about it. He didn't want it there any longer. Three years he'd been waiting and saw no fruit. He said, cut her down. And that's his complaint. Then we come to thought number six, and that is a solemn question. Why cometh it to ground? Verse seven. He said, why should I go and fertilize this ground every year, protect this tree from harm, and then I come here year after year and I don't find a fig on the tree. I wonder how God feels about us. God's been good to us. He's blessed us. He's helped us. He's been good to us. And yet uh, God looks and there's no fruit. 
He said, why should I keep on being good to this tree? Why should I keep on a fertilizer tree? And why should I continue waiting when I've waited three years? I've done my best. I've fertilized the tree. I've protected the tree. There's no fruit on it. And he said, why should I just let it drain the ground? Why let the tree come to the ground? Why let it keep on sapping the fertilizer from the ground, the street from the ground? Why let it do that? Why waste my fertilizer? Why waste the strength of this ground when I can cut this tree down and put another there that will produce the goods? Why let it drain the ground? Why let it hinder other trees around about it and draw strength from them? Why let it stand when another could be put in its place? We'll just cut her down and I'll put another fig tree there, saith the owner, and let it produce the goods. Why let it be a pretender? While this tree is pretending that it's a fruit bearer and it hasn't produced the first fig, not the first one. Why should I let this tree continue to be a pretender? It's a fig tree, but no figs. And the saved people listening to me today in this auditorium and out in the radio listening audience, you're saved, you're pretending to be a number one Christian, and yet you're not producing any fruit. That's what he's talking about here. Why let it be a pretender? And then we come to thought number seven, and that is the dresser, the man that kept the vineyard. Notice his intercession, the dresser's intercession, verse 89. And he answered and said unto him, Lord, let it alone this year also, till I dig about it and fertilize it, and if it bear fruit, well, if not, then after that, thou shalt cut it down. And so the dresser of the vineyard said uh, uh, to the Lord of the vineyard, he said, let's spare it one more year. Let it alone one more year. I'm going to re-fertilize this ground around this tree. I'm going to dig around this tree. And there's no excuse for this tree not producing the goods. And then, Lord, if it don't produce, we'll whack her down. Jesus Christ is our intercessor. He's at the right hand of God, making intercession for us. There may be a time when the Father become impatient. And Jesus said, Father, one more year. Let's see what happens. I'll bless them real good. They'll be fertilized. They'll have the word of God preached to them. The spirit of God will be with them. But if they don't produce the fruit in this year, then we'll cut it out. This year also, verse 8. In John chapter 17 and verse 5, I pray not that thou should take them out of the world, but thou should keep them from the evil. Jesus said, Father, I don't suggest to cut them off and take them out of the world, but just keep them from the evil. Keep them here in the world. There's many of the church members still in the vineyard, the place of fruit bearing, but bears nothing. And we never know this year could be our last year. We don't know when the Lord's coming. We don't know when God's going to call us home. Now the intercessor promised to do some work about it. He said, I'll dig about it and I'll fertilize it. Now there's been times when God had to dig around our being. Dig around our lives. Stir us up. Shake us up. Let things happen to really put us to thinking. To really shake us up. To really bring us where he wants us. The digging. That's the digging phase around our lives. I know Christian people weren't worth a dime with a hole in it. Till God had to really dig them up. And when God got through digging, they produced the fruit. And if God decides to do a little digging around us, when God gets through digging, we'll get busy about some fruit bearing. Every born again believer should strive to produce fruit. I'll dig about it. Now if God begins to dig around you this year, then maybe God wants some more fruit. If God digs around me, maybe God is seeking fruit. God wants us to produce fruit. God has many different ways in which he can do some digging. And he knows how to dig and when to dig. And sometimes the pick goes quite deep in the soil. And we need to realize that. He agreed then that the result should be final. In verse 9 he said, after that, 
Lord of the vineyard, after I fertilize the fig tree again, and I dig around it again, and if it doesn't produce fruit this year, then that's final. I won't plead for it any longer. We just won't wait any longer. I'll take the ax and cut the thing down. There's been many of a Christian that's been cut down and cut off because God saw they would never produce the fruit. God been good to them and blessed them and watched over them and yet they don't consider producing any fruit and God said we'll just cut them down and get them out of the way. And that's happened to many of a saved person. There's some people in heaven today, empty handed, could be down here serving God, but God saw they didn't intend to bring any fruit, didn't intend to produce any, and God said just cut them down just take them on, move them out of the way. Now there comes a time when that year is final. God draws the line. He said this year also. And then if we see no fruit, that's it. Down goes the fig tree. We never know when God is checking our lives or our church, digging about us, checking to see whether or not we're going to bring the fruit or have been bringing the fruit or producing the fruit. And this is serious matter in this new year as we now enter the new year. I hope every one of you, not only in this building, but in the radio listening audience, will determine by the help and grace of God that you're going to produce some fruit, more so in the coming year than you have in the past year. God help you to do so. You have listened well. Stand to your feet. Our Father, I pray that you'll take the message, that you use it to thy glory, May thy name be honored and may Jesus be glorified. God, I pray that you'll help us to produce the fruit to the glory of God. Save somebody today, Lord. We don't know a better time for somebody to be saved either here or in the radio listed audience than this day, this first Sunday in the new year. Have your way in the invitation, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. While Debbie is playing, if you're in the building and you need to come forward to be saved, to reclaim, to join the church, or for any reason, for any reason, I want you to come while she plays. speaking obey the Lord come forward do what God tells you to do while we wait if God is speaking would you come